Ja kuuluuko mennään nyt täältä läpi? Niin, kuuluuko toi? Tota, mä en tiedä. Nyt, se, nyt mun rupesi tapahtua jotain. Tää lukee laitu, kyllä nurkas, mutta... Nyt tuli musta ruutu. Ihan supermahtava. Täällä on... Mä en systeä mitä auki. Tota, stream outputti näyttää vähän nihkeeltä. Niin näyttääkö se enää mitään? Sun pitää... Kata varmaan sen ty... Tulee vai? Update list viime. Nyt näkyy. Tää meni sekas. Mitä? Se näkyy. Tää meni ihan sekas. EPG tuossa viimalla. Ja meidän kuvat. Joo. Ja. Niin joo, se meni ihan sekas. Se rupee striimaamaan vaikka mitä. Joo, nyt se on väärä striimi. Erkki lähti. No, kun se haluaa sen kautta mun slide-settiä. Excellent connection. Siis onko se useampi skeneeseen vai? On. Mulla näkyy itselleen nää slide-settiä, mutta ei... Painoiko se Senttula Stream tai Senttula Live? Okay. Jos on keltaisena, niin silloin se tarkoittaa, että siellä on jotain muutoksia, mitä se ei ole lähettänyt vielä laiviin. Nyt ne on kaikki siellä. Mulla näkyy itselleni tämä myös laivisetti, mutta se ei näy nyt laivissa. Stream output on musta ruutu. Kyllä. Mä pajaan uudestaan ruutun. Äh, Livestream ei lähetä sinne streamiin nyt mitään tällä hetkellä. Tuli kalvot ainakin tuohon outputtiin. Tuleekohan tänne mm-hmm. YouTuben puolellekin kohta. Nyt ilmestyi. Tässä on Joo. 10 sekunnin delay ainakin. Joo. Nyt ja. tuo kalvo näkyy, no se kasvaa kohti. Jo. Se pysyy tuon koko sen, no se johtuu tuosta jaosta. Stream speed rate is lower than recommended. We recommend you stream speed rate of 2500 kbps. Pystytkö se komppaista jostain? Tämä on 720. Niin, mun näkeekö speed rate jossain? Ei se sanoa. Mutta tota, pystytkö sä jostain tsekkaamaan, että kuinka paljon nämä ääni kuuluu läpi täältä striimiin? Niin, se olisi. Tota, miten mä sen pystyn tekemään, kun mä kuulen teitä täällä? Pystytkö te mutettamaan itse okay. nyt tähän tota, ruumiin? Mä oon luvekku yksi muuta mikkinä, että se varmaan mikin mutettaa tähän ruumiin. Okei, okay, no mä hyppään tota, tästä ruumista nyt mäkeen. Niin, tota... Ehkä se on parempi, joka tapauksessa, että näet se, niin vetä meille jonnekin slackia, jos tulee jotain. <köhön> parempi pekkoon tausta. Mm-hmm.
Tekis me ei käydä tuo alakerras nyt vähän sanomassa, nyt loppuu se naputtaminen. <tos> ei toi naputus kuulu, oikeastaan läpi. Poraaminen kuulu. Ei, nyt, se, nyt, on, nyt on suht hiljaista, mutta kohta alkaa varmaan hirveä poraaminen. Mm. Okei, okay. kaikki meidän höpinä kuuluu streamissä. Hieno homma.
Noin. Joo. All right. So we are here with Erkki Paila. Hello. And we will be starting this webinar soon. Let's wait a little while for everybody to join in. Uh, if you haven't already joined in our WhatsApp group for questions and support, you can find the link on the screen. Fol by following that, you can join in the WhatsApp group. And if you're interested in getting a teacher account in Edit and Playground, follow up the link on the screen to register yourself. Uh, we will be starting this webinar of best practices for remote math teaching shortly. Actually, the time is now 11, so Erke, I think we can get started. Yeah, definitely. Let's get started. I'm excited to get started on this. Definitely. There's been a lot of messaging in the WhatsApp group already this morning. I'd be really happy to see people all around the world. So very warm welcome to this webinar and to learn more about how to cope with the challenges of remote learning. But first of all, greetings from Finland. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not really looking exactly like that in Finland at the moment. We are having spring, although we did actually have snow like two days ago, so the spring is coming, but we, it will usually take a while. But I think there are some some images which you may find familiar if you think about Finland. And uh, well, that's basically what, is, what it's like here. But it, it's great to have people from all around the world to take part in this seminar. So as we said before, we're really excited to have so many of you here listening to us. Yeah, and who we are? Well, my name is Eikka. I'm the head of pedagogy at Eduten, and ma mainly I'm responsible for uh, the pedagogical approach of uh, what we do here at Eduten. Uh, I train a lot of teachers, and actually during the past three weeks, I have trained over a thousand teachers to use the same tools that, and methods we talk, we will talk to you about today. Uh, my background is in, in education. I'm a teacher myself, but I'm also graduated from the IT side. So. This is kind of my dream come true job to be able to help teachers with educational technology. And here's my colleague, Erki Kaila. Yeah, nice to meet you all. So I'm uh, Dr. Erki Kaila. I'm the head of research in Edison. So as the title implies, I'm mostly responsible for, for conducting our studies and uh, for producing a lot of these materials. We're using a lot of these pedagogical materials with EICA. Uh, I also have a position in the University of Helsinki, where I'm doing research, and uh, I'm also teaching there. I'm teaching computer science, but I'm researching learning analytics and digital learning, and all things con connected to those those things. Perfect. So the big question is, <clears throat> how did we make the transformation to remote learning in Finland? Basically, this happened overnight. So one day the government rules that the following day the school will be closed and all teaching will happen online and the only explanation i can come up with is that we are a bit crazy as you can might see in the picture well the crazy might not be the right word but something that is often used to describe finnish people is sisu mentality sisu is a finnish word and it means it enables us to take the extraordinary action to overcome mentally or physically challenging situations. Or basically, it's the willpower to do anything, even though it seems impossible. And this is something that is very, very typical for Finnish people. Yeah, definitely. And uh, and the uh, things connected to CISO are, I, I, I think the main thing here is that uh, we are not afraid of change. We are not afraid to, to face new challenges. And uh, that's really important in a situation like this, where most of the things happening here are new to everyone, are new to teachers, new to students, and everyone needs to be accustomed to new things really quickly. And that's why it's important that you're not afraid to try out new things. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how, how you can do the same transformation yourself in wherever you are. Exactly. And this did not happen overnight. Like, well, it happened overnight, but of course there are 
uh, problems in the beginning. It, it's next it takes a little time to adjust to learn the new tools to find the best best practices but basically the overall uh, consensus at the moment is that finnish teachers manage to do this transformation really quickly and quite effortless of course our teachers are really exhausted they have learned a lot of new things but it looks like uh, to homes to decision makers that they managed to do this really really well and today we want to help you to learn from our mistakes and our uh, experiences how to do this transformation. Yeah, so, so we do have a lot of experience on remote teaching ourselves. And uh, we've been talking with a lot of teachers in past past couple of weeks, as Eko mentioned. He's, he has been training like a thousand new teachers in Finland only. Uh, I've been talking with a lot of lot of my colleagues and with a lot of teachers from all levels, and uh, the change hasn't always be, been easy, and that's also the reason why we wanted to have this seminar to sort of share the experiences and share share the things we have learned about the transformation to remote learning as well. Uh, by the way, by the way, funny thing, uh, we actually first decided to do this in Zoom, which is a very familiar tool for for us, but to the reason. Uh, publicity of Zoom platform, we decided to take a different approach. And this is a completely new tool and approach for us too. So we are also learning a lot today. Yeah, well, this is basically the thing we're talking about as well. We need new tools, we need them fast, we need to do the transformation fast. Uh, I think the basic, in the in this slide, the basic idea of remote learning is displayed in four, four steps. This is a slide by Harta Pönkä, a really great guy in Finland very enthusiastic about digital learning opportunities and, and things like that. Uh, and the basic approach in here is that we start in the first step with an introduction by the teacher. <clears throat> We're going to talk about this a bit, bit more in detail, but this we think is a crucial step, something you should always start with. Start in, by introducing the whatever the topic is, however brief the introduction is, it is still important. Uh, and then the next phase is where the actual learning happens, where the students are taking or are doing the exercises. They might be doing them alone or in small groups. Variation is of course great. Some exercises should probably be done alone, some in small groups, some in larger groups. Uh, and then it's important that the teacher is a part of that process by giving feedback, by answering questions, by giving whatever support is needed to uh, keep completing the exercises. And then the final step is the verif verification where where we find out, where we actually apply the knowledge and then find out whether the learning has happened, whether it was, it's with continuous assessment or with exams, probably digital or electronic exams. And uh, uh, well, that's like the basic process. That's what we're going to talk about today, but in, yeah. in more detail. Sure. Uh I'd like to add here something. Uh, yeah, please do. Like basically, basically, I think the hardest part, uh, personally for me, is the step four, the application, to make sure that the uh, students have uh, uh, <coughs> met the learning goals. Uh, basically, it's really hard to verify that. There's actually two ways we can do that. We can rely on continuous assessment, which is, of course, enabled uh, for us through digital tools or we can have exams online to verify learning, but there's of course a okay, caveat for that as well. But I think we can dive a bit deeper into the individual steps here. Uh, the key takeaway here is that don't take shortcuts and it's still really important for you as teachers to stay in touch with students, even though it's not face-to-face, -face. but luckily there are other ways to do that. Uh, it might be webinars, it might be chats, WhatsApps or something like that, but students are really missing you. So let's go. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so we've divided the things to remember in remote teaching in, in some steps. I think we have four, four or five steps, however you want to count them in here. Uh, and the first thing which we find really crucial is setting goals. So it's important that the students know what they are doing. They need to know this basically every day. I think typical approach in Finland is that each day starts with a short or relatively short, could be five minutes, could, can be 15 minutes, can be an hour, 
uh, anyway a session in your video chat or or something like that where the teacher sets up the goals for that day and uh, that's that's really important even even with great digital tools it's crucial that the teacher spend some time with students each day discusses what they're learning why are they learning this stuff for what is why it's important and so on this is something that needs to have greater emphasis when we do teaching remotely in classroom setup this comes quite naturally uh, you lead the way you tell them which pages to open what exercises you're going to do now and so on uh, when we do learning remotely the student's role becomes bigger basically the role of active learning becomes huge and that's why students need clear instructions and clear goals what they should be doing uh, and this is this is in that way it's just really important definitely and uh, another important thing here is to realize that different students might need different goals uh, so i actually talked it with, with one of my one of my friends who's a teacher just yesterday and uh, he mentioned that there are there are huge differences between students as you all know so when he said the goals for one day one of the students completed them before 10 a.m. in the morning, one of the students returned his homework at 8 p.m. at night. Uh, and, uh, we all know that that might have a huge effect on motivation. If the things are too difficult, if they are too easy, that's not something you want. And uh, that's why it's important to be able to set different goals to different students based on their skill levels, based on what they know at the moment. And now it's really important that Again, you are not present in the classroom. You can't help the students uh, side by side or, or hand, hand in hand. Uh, students are basically studying mostly alone. If they're lucky, their parents are able to help them. But many, many students don't have that luxury. So also the goals might not be as high as they would be in classroom setup. And this is something we just need to accept. Uh, we need to do the best we can. Yeah, definitely. That's a, that's a really good point. Okay, the second step, gamifying the experience. Um, Eric, would you please elaborate on this? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so especially since we're, again, when we're working in a remote environment, uh, seeing the progress might not be as easy as it is in classroom. Uh, and that's why it's important that uh, we use some some kind of gamified elements to display the progress to students and uh, some of the things we find useful are for example digital trophies or or progress bars or or awards or what whatever you can complete or whatever you can get when you complete enough tasks over there uh, but the main thing here is to keep students engaged so instead of just doing like random tasks one at a time set we set the goal like this is the task you need to complete today and then display the progress and so okay now you completed one third of these tasks or half of these tasks and great you're almost there you're doing you're doing a good job and these are all really necessary and really important like forms of feedback in this in this situation yeah, yeah this really helps the students to reach their goals so when they can see uh, how far i am from my goal today it's easier to complete the steps to reach the goal uh, if, there, it's, if it's unclear, what should I do? Uh, how much do I have left? Uh, have I completed my goals? It's much more difficult. And again, you are not there to remind them about their goals all the time. So gamification is actually a crucial element in this to kind of set the clear goals and let the students know how far they are, how close they are reaching their daily or weekly goals. Well, I think the one of the main things in remote teaching is actually uh, how to know what the students are doing, how well they are doing, uh, are they doing anything? And in here, the uh, kind of analyzing and acting based on the results plays a key role. Definitely. And uh, <clears throat> one of the crucial things again in here is that when you're in the classroom with your students, it's really easy for students to ask for assistance. If they don't know something, they can raise their hands. Or when you go around the classroom, you can talk to each of them at a time. And it's easy to ask help because you're there and you're discussing with them like you are 
normally. When they're doing remote work, asking for assistance can be a lot more difficult. It can be a huge step for students to take. They might not know how to do that technically, and even if they do, they might not be sort of brave enough to do that. Uh, that's why learning analytics is a great tool for this. It means that when you can see how the students are doing and whether they are struggling with some topics, sort of gives you the tool, gives you the knowledge you need I think we lost Erki here for a while, uh, probably some network issues. Uh, this is quite typical in remote teaching. We just need to learn to go with this. Uh, hopefully he will be back soon. Uh, it's not just remote teaching, it's also remote working. So we are working remotely from home. Uh, but like Erki was saying, students might not be brave enough to ask questions. So you need to be proactive. But there's also a counterexample. Um, I've been helping out a lot of teachers and students during the school closure uh, using uh, our platform, American Playground. I, I've noticed that some students are actually quite keen on, uh, they're actually trying to find excuses not to complete the work. So this is also something that you don't need to actually even tolerate. You just have to tell them that you have, you need to find a way how you overcome the issues, or you need to follow the instructions closely. But that's, of course, a minor issue, but something to keep in mind. That students are clever in this way, and they might try to find out the easy way out. All right, uh, I think the number four is probably the most important step here. Uh, even though we are working remotely, uh, we are not attending school, and and we are at home, it's super important to keep up the routines. This is something that will help the students to perform better. Uh, it will help them to uh, stay kind of in a normal day-to-day uh, -day routine. And this does not necessarily mean that you hold up your old schedule. Like every morning starts at 7.30 with math lesson, then follows English lesson, then follows PE and so on. No, you might have a completely different schedule for remote teaching, but it's important that you have one. And if possible, it's really important to have uh, daily sessions together with the students. You can even start the day together. It doesn't have to be long, but just say hello, ask how, they, how they're doing. And of course, uh, usually it's a really good idea to include uh, some kind of in introduction session to that as well. Okay, Let's I'm back. We can get Erki back here. Yeah, I'm, I'm back here. So, so to demonstrate some of the possible difficulties with remote learning, my internet connection sort of did something strange, and I dropped out for for a couple of minutes. But I'm back here, and I'm sure you had a wonderful time with Eikko when I was gone. All right. Uh, I'm not sure how much you heard what I said. Uh, is there something else you might want to add for uh, routines? Maybe something I forgot. I heard what you said. I think I think that that's like the main part. The main part is to keeping up the routines. The main part is to often something secure and something comfortable and something sort of not frightening the students. I think that's important. It's uh, it's sort of obvious that you can't do the same things you do in school when you're doing remote learning. You need to give up on something, but it's in really important that the students still feel that they're they're in a school, they have a teacher they can rely on, and they are still learning, and they have their routines. They start the morning similar than they do usually, and then they have a school day, and after that they have their free time. And that's that's really important, even if the school day is really different than what it is usually. One lesson we learned here in Finland is actually uh, we don't reach all the kids. Some kids just stay offline. And uh, we have in schools usually uh, some school assistants who help the teacher in the classroom and, and take care of some of the students who are struggling maybe and so on. We actually um, 
the school assistants actually call some of the students who are not appearing in the online sessions and they confirm that everything is going well at home, that there's no problems, that if there's something that maybe uh, if, if there's a technical problem, maybe, maybe uh, the assistant can give some instructions over the phone or something like that. So there are also these more traditional ways to reach some kids. Definitely. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's move on and <clears throat> talk a little bit about the tools and resources you can do to deliver uh, online teaching and, and great remote teaching experience uh, for you as a teacher and also for the students. First of all, I feel that the video conferencing software is really crucial here. It gives you the possibility to interact with the students uh, as closely as possible with normal situation and um, i've listed some of the tools here that you might already be using google meet microsoft teams maybe skype uh, also zoom has been really popular but like i said uh, in the beginning there have been some security concerns and it's been prohibited in some countries completely but if, if you are still using it i don't see a huge problem there there are a ton of other platforms as well. And if you don't have the possibility to use video conferencing, something like WhatsApp or Line or Discord or some kind of this um, instant messaging software might be enough to reach children. Yeah, uh, one thing to notice is that this list are by no means comprehensive. There are a lot of other tools. Uh, it's of course, if you're as I said, if you're familiar with some tools, it's a good idea to keep on using them, especially if you're if you have been using some tools with your students before, for example, for video conferencing or or whatever. It's definitely a good idea to not to increase the cognitive load in this moment, but to try to focus on the tools. We do have some tips about selecting proper tools like pedagogically valid tools coming up in a minute. Yeah. And of course, the video conferencing is not the only uh, only tools you will be needing. Uh, there are other really great tools for sharing material, uh, sharing maybe worksheets, uh, getting handouts back from students and, and all these kind of things. Uh, Google Apps for Education is really great. You have uh, file sharing through Drive. You have Google Docs for writing uh, essays or writing any, ass uh, any assignments. And, and so on. You might be using Microsoft Office 365. Uh, that's also a great way, a great alternative to Google Apps for education. I've heard that a lot of teachers are using Seesaw. It's not quite the same as Google Apps for education or Office 365, but it allows uh, students to communicate, to uh, send pictures, share pictures, share files, and all that kind of thing. So if this is something you are maybe familiar with, it's really worth taking a look at that. And then we have the last category, which is just uh, others. Uh, there are a lot of uh, great tools and resources you can use. Uh, it's a good idea if, 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 you, if you have any online platforms with online uh, exercises that the students can do. Maybe they can get some feedback from the exercises. Uh, maybe you can see any analytics on what the students are doing. Uh, we will be presenting you today Edition Playground for math, edu math education and the kind of how we have handled the gaming and learning analytics and all that. You can learn a lot from that, even though you are maybe using completely something else. Or if you don't have any tools for that, you are free to use Edit and Playground uh, for the following 60 days. One great resource is Khan Academy. There's a lot of videos for instructions. There's also some exercises available. And well, like I said, if you have any platforms you are currently using, it's really really good idea to now use the full use them in full extent uh, there are other resources like pinterest facebook and things like that where you can find a lot of ideas and what kind of things to do and uh i've linked here uh goal.me which it's actually finished at me school school.me 
And there's also a huge uh, amount, a huge list of uh, potential applications and resources you might be interested in during the school closure. Well, Erki, I think you had something to add here. Uh, yeah, actually, actually, we can move on to the next slide because I think we, well, I want to talk about a bit more about selecting a pedagogically valid tool, and if we call it sure. some some hints and tips about how to select select the proper tool. Uh, so there are some highlighted words over there which we find find important in a tool, and this is something we've been actually researching quite a lot. And actually, Eka is just finishing his PhD about this. In, in any day now, uh, or something similar. Uh, but the first thing is about a content. So try to find something which, which contains enough good quality content and content that supports your curriculum. Uh, you're going to be really busy during this time, doing the remote learning, as you probably have noticed before, you probably don't have time to come up with as much content as needed by yourself. So it's crucial to find a tool that already contains the content. It's also a good idea to try to find a tool that's based on uh, actually working pedagogical principles and which can provide real learning results. There are some tools over there which might seem appealing with really like game-like, cartoon-like graphics and things like that, but with really little, very little like actually working content. So try to find something that's actually evidence-based with a lot of good feedback from other teachers. Uh, and we talked about analytics before, so it's important, as I mentioned, to get enough feedback to you as well, to find out how the students are doing when they are doing the exercises and whether they are having problems in any of the topics and any of the exercises so that you can offer help whenever it's needed and as soon as possible. Uh, and try to find a tool that's easy enough to adapt and use, as we talked again talked about before. Any additional cognitive load in this moment is probably too, not, too much. If it takes students a day or two to learn to, to how to use the system, that's a day or two you have lost like valuable learning time. And, and the same for you, it should be easy enough for teachers as well. And the final thing, something which we have again mentioned a couple of times is uh, try to find whatever tool you're using, find something that provides a good communication channel between school and home, something you can use to actually talk with your students or communicate with your students to get feedback and to provide feedback. That's really comprehensive description. Uh, something, before we move on here, something I just want to mention, we are listing a lot of things what teachers should do and should not do. Uh, remote teaching is actually really time consuming and it's, it might swallow you. So it's also really important that you restrict your day, that you also decide that you start your day at eight o'clock and then you finish off at four o'clock or five o'clock. Otherwise, you are online all the time and you will be really exhausted really fast. So even though we are loading up you with a lot of demands here, remember you are just a human being and you need your rest as well. That's, that's, really, about it. that's a really good point. That's something we should try to remember ourselves as well. And, and something I'm trying to do, I'm trying to decide in the morning that today I'm going to end my work day at five or six or whatever. And, and at that time, put away your laptop, put it in a bag and spend some time with your family. Yeah. It provides the assistance of the teacher, but it's by no means ruled out from any of this. Uh, this is actually a really good measurement where the students can uh, solve the problems on their own. And this is actually something that also links really great to the growth mindset. So if the students are having an open mindset, they are actually able to overcome even more difficult problems that they used to, and they're not afraid of making mistakes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, please. Sorry, I just want to mention, mention here that uh, we've actually written a couple of free guides about Finland math and about how to use this pedagogical aspect in your own classroom, and which also apply to remote learning, at least mostly. And you can download them freely from our website, from finlandmath.com. And uh, I think if the link is not already in the chat room, then you can probably provide a direct link to downloading the guides. So you should definitely take a take a look. There are there are some like actual actual practical tips on how to apply the Finnish way to teach mathematics in your classroom, even when you're doing it remotely. And something I really want to highlight here is the stress-free learning. Uh, now that we are doing remote teaching, we still don't want to load up all the work on the students, but we just we need to be the 
gatekeepers and hold this kind of steady pace and make sure that we don't strain all the students, but also that make sure that they are still learning things. So uh, let's try to keep that in mind. All right, uh, let's move on to actually the practical view of how we use Edutain Playground during the remote teaching part. And uh, Edutain Playground is a math learning platform that is, has great emphasis on gamification. It contains the full math curriculum based on the Finnish uh, math curriculum for ages 6 to 15 or grades 1 to 9, however you want to put that. Uh, the thing that makes Edition Playground interesting is that a lot of teachers in Finland are choosing this voluntarily. If you are aware how autonomous uh, Finnish teachers are, and basically they are really autonomous, they can decide themselves uh, which tools they want to use. Uh, the headmaster or the school owner or anyone else does not make these decisions, but each teacher can decide themselves which tools they want to use. Uh, almost half of the schools in Finland are using the playground. And now during the school closure, like I mentioned, I've been training over a thousand teachers during the past three weeks to use the playground also here in Finland. So uh, I think that tells me more about how valuable they think it is than what I ever have found out in any of my research that I have done previously. Uh, what you what is important to know about the Edutain Playground? It's a cloud service, so you can access it with any modern device uh, through a web browser, whether it's a computer, laptop, tablet, or a mobile phone. So that should be quite easy for a lot of students and teachers as well. Uh, in the beginning, we shared a link where you can actually sign up uh, for Edutain Playground teacher account if you're interested in. Uh, I will be showing the link to you again in a while, but now I will be telling you a little bit uh, what kind of research results we have uh, using this platform and what are the key takeaways in, con in like considering gamification or actually how to use it. So let's move on. Uh, this is one of the studies included also in my PhD. This is uh, conducted in 2018 in Lithuania. Uh, this was a 15-week study, and basically what we did here, we had two groups, one using Edutain Playground, one not using it, and with the students using Edutain Playground, we replaced one math lesson a week with digital learning. And only in 15 weeks, we were able to see this huge difference in the students' math skills and their ability to uh, uh, count basic arithmetic problems like math fluency. We also did another study more recently in United Arab Emirates uh, with almost 800 students. And again, only in six weeks, we were able to get a huge difference between the student skills uh, before and after using Edutain Playground. I'm actually going to say, say something here uh, yeah. as, as a head of research. Uh, so actually, we've been, we've been getting, and, and these are great results, and we've been getting a lot of kind of results from all over in Hong Kong, for example. But uh, this has also been like one of the main principles we've been having when we have been developing the system on editor, well, the whole editor playground, and uh, to find out which things actually work and which things don't. And uh, it's uh, we've been talking about research-based development where we test new features and we only use the features that are actually actually working. So it's 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 been really really sort of crucial and important thing in the whole development process. Definitely. And basically, why do we get the great results? Well, the secret is here. With Edutain Playground, students complete a lot more tasks than they would do otherwise. Uh, in one of the studies, students completed, on average, notice, on average, 260 calculations a week. And this is only the Edutain Playground lesson, so one lesson a week, and all the other lessons on top of this. Uh, so they get a lot of practice, and, and this is why they actually learn more. The secret is that the students don't feel like they are uh, completing that much exercises, but they actually are, so they get a lot of practice. So basically, 
our target is always to think about is there a better way to use teachers time so we know you are busy and we know you are you already have a lot of on your plate so that's why we try to help your workload your burden uh, we try to uh, minimize the time using on paperwork and testing and all that and give you more time to support teaching that's why all our exercises are automatically assessed and it all already uh, provides you with the analytics automatically um, these learning analytics can be used to help teachers to understand students better who are struggling uh, who are doing really well who's not doing anything and so on so you get the instant feedback of how your class is doing and which students need more support from you and which can just learn on their own and after all this applying uh we can see already in the research that this will improve the students grades so they will actually improve their grades instead of just uh, doing nothing uh, let's take a look at a couple of the key things here, how it works, and then I will be showing you a concrete uh, weekly schedule, how you can apply these principles in remote teaching. First of all, uh, instead of doing exercises from your exercise book, which is still really valid, you can still do that, uh, replace one or more of these kind of lessons or learning sessions with Editon Playground. Uh, Every teacher and every student will have their own account in the platform. And that's how we are also able to keep track of uh, the students' learning progress. We have divided each grade level into courses. So we call grade level a course. And courses are already divided into lessons. So we have made the lesson plans for you already. It's only one click to open a new lesson. Uh, you can use uh, one to three lessons each week. It's up to you. Maybe you can start with one. And one lesson contains 25 to 30 exercises, which translates roughly to 45 to 90 minutes of active learning time. That gives you a rough estimate how much work it is. And from each of these lessons, students will achieve trophies, the ones you can see here on the right. And this is now a crucial part of the gamification, setting goals and uh, giving students progress bars so they know uh, how much work they have completed and where the goals are. And lesson is completed only after the student gets one of those trophies. So basically what I suggest is that you fix certain days in your weekly schedule when you open new content, new lessons in Edit and Playground. It doesn't have to be Monday and Wednesday. It can be only Monday. It can be Monday and Wednesday. It can be Monday, Wednesday and Friday if you feel like it. Uh, I think you can start first with uh, one day and then if, if it looks like the students are doing well, just add some more. Every time you open a new lesson, have a short video conference or instructional video for instructions because there's always a new topic in each lesson so it's a good idea to just go through quickly uh, the exercises in the lesson and, and instruct how to solve these kind of problems and every time you open a new lesson that's a really good spot to take a look at the previous lessons uh, uh, scores and achievements the trophies and act accordingly but like we stated already beforehand, uh, it's important to keep following up the learning progress. And that's why we provide the live learning data uh, for, from the students. So you know all the time who's working, who's not working, who has completed already their exercises for uh, this lesson and who's still struggling. Uh, if there is problems, you will know where the problems are and so on. And you are able to react to those problems. Uh, I want to highlight some of the key factors here, uh, why things are working really well with Edmonton Playground. Maybe this is something that can be also matched with some other platform if you like. Uh, basically, now that we are working remotely, this is the only way to actually see what the students are doing. So it's like the exercise math exercise book 
uh, but it's better. It gives you the visibility on what the students are doing. So they don't need to photograph the pages and all that. You will get a kind of summary of what the students are doing and how well they're doing. And this will help uh, you to react to maybe differentiate the students, uh, maybe give some additional tasks, easier tasks or so on. What I think is crucial here is active learning. And this is something that uh, should be considered also remote learning. Uh, when we are learning remotely, we have a lot more emphasis on active learning. So basically students are not listening that much uh, you teaching. That's, I, I consider that quite a passive way, but they're actually practicing more. They're actively learning and, and completing exercises. And this is where digital tools are really good at. Uh, every time a student gives answer in a playground, they will get a feedback whether the answer is correct or not. If they get correct answer, it helps them to move forward. It uh, improves their self-confidence. It gives it, it's a sign that, okay, you know what you are doing. On the other hand, if you make a mistake, you know that, okay, this is not the way how I solve uh, this kind of problem. I need to figure out where my mistake is. Uh, a lot of students can figure out it on their own if they just take a minute to consider that a little bit. Otherwise, they can ask the teacher for help. Like, teacher, teacher, I don't know what to do. Can you please help me? And we have great tools for this kind of communication. Yeah, also also an important thing yeah. here is that uh, whenever you try an exercise as a student, you can always try it again immediately. So if you fail in that, you get a similar calculation with a bit, maybe like a little different numbers, but anyway, and you can keep on doing it until you succeed, until you get the positive feedback. And uh, about the active learning, if you remember the slide we saw at the very beginning of like the basic idea of remote learning, where we start with teacher introduction, and then the actual cycle of those two steps is the doing the exercises, doing the tasks, whatever they are, and then getting feedback from teacher, from the tool, and that's where the actual learning happens. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Really good point. And so interesting part is also that uh, we have a lot of variation also in the platform itself. Uh, variation is the key to keep uh, learning interesting. So we have more than 150 different exercise types that change over lessons and topics and so on. So that also uh, helps the students to stay motivated and create some variation in the practicing. So it's not just repeating all multiple choice questions, but there's actually some variation in it. All right, uh, now it's actually time for me to move on to the actual platform and show you around how it works, give you the first-hand experience. I'm going to start from the student side first to give you the outline, the key things, uh, what the students should be aware of. And then I will help you to set up your teacher account uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, here's the address, tinyurlcom slash and sign up. And this will open up let me share i'll switch to another screen and show you the sign up uh, form give me a second uh, we can walk these steps actually together Here we go, and then I still need to switch the screen sharing. Let, let's try this. Yeah, great. Actually, I can mention at this time that I will be mostly on. I think we lost you again, Erki. But uh, let me continue from here. So if you are interested in getting an uh, Edison Playground account for yourself as a teacher, just follow up to tinyurl.com slash Edison sign up and fill in the form. Uh, select I'm a teacher, write your name, 
Oh, my bad. Not for Finnish teachers. We have different tools for you guys. Add your email address. This will be your username to Edutain Playground. So remember that and make sure you write it correctly. Uh, add your phone number. School name. This is now, I don't, I don't work in school right now. So I'm just going to show you an example. And the city I mean is called Turku. And then click create account. We will email you your password and then you can log in with that uh, uh, email address and email password. And I will log in to my editing playground. I have an example uh, course for us that I will be using uh, for this uh, demonstration for you. The first time I log in, uh, it will take me, of course, to teacher side. I have a teacher account as well as you. Uh, this is now the following steps I'm going to show you are something that are only visible on my screen. So you can now concentrate on watching the live stream. And I recommend anyway that you don't try to replicate all the steps immediately uh, during the live stream, but uh, you can figure out these afterwards. Uh, in the email that we send with the password, there is a getting started quick video tutorial, which is only three minutes and it will cover the most important basics, how to get started as a teacher. So let me switch to student view. And here we have a remote teaching webinar training course. So this is a first grade math course uh, with some examples that I will be showing you and I can introduce you how Edit and Playground works. And um, I have opened up one lesson. So there's only the lessons visible that student, uh, the teacher has made available for me and I have only made one lesson available. So this is a clear goal for me as a student that I need to work on this lesson. Uh, some key elements in the user interface Edutain logo on top left, it will always take you back to your dashboard. So if you get lost, just click the Edutain logo and you're back here. Uh, if you have multiple courses, use the drop down to switch between them, but you should only have basically one. And on the right side, we have the user menu. Uh, my admin account has a lot of stuff here, but there are some key things like my profile. You can change your name, password, email address, and all that. Uh, you can switch between teacher and student views like I just did. Uh, you have the support section, which contains instructions, videos, uh, all that to help you out get started. And if you face any problems, there's the feedback button that you can use to contact us. Uh, and finally, of course, when we need to stop, there's the lockout button. So we can quit working with the platform. But now I'm going to show you a couple of examples of the different exercise types. These are from first grade math, but it actually doesn't matter. I have selected the first grade math because the exercises are simple and quick to complete. So you get the basic idea. Uh, let's start by clicking the lesson name. In here, we have 25 exercises available. Uh, on top of the screen, we have uh, the progress bar, the trophies. Currently, we have zero points. And uh, in the list, we can select and pick any exercise we want. We don't have to do them in order. But the easiest exercises are first. You can see here, uh, the first one is easy. Then we have the blue one, moderate. And we have some extra exercises, some problem exercises, even something called programming. Uh, this is more like computational thinking, logical problem solving, but it's something that is included in the Finnish math curriculum. So you will also automatically have this included in every lesson. And then we have hard and challenge. Even though I don't have to start with the first one, this time I will. 
The puzzle number 10 is a good example of certain type of exercise, so I click that. First, we have some instructions from the number 10. All right, we can close the pop up by pressing close. On top left, we have the white info icon that will open up the instruction again if you miss it. So you can review it every time, anytime you like. And now we need to solve this puzzle by drag and drop into pieces in correct places. Like this. Once we are done, to get the final assessment from this exercise, we click Submit. And this will give us the uh, scoring for this exercise, some cheers, and we can see that our progress towards the bronze trophy has now begun. We can go straight away to the next exercise by clicking the arrow, or we can go back to the list where we have all the exercises to pick any other exercise. Or we can even go ahead, close this one, press the reset button on top, and start over, over again. Uh, one pro tip, if drag and dropping is difficult, maybe on some touchscreen device, you can click the piece, click to move it, click the piece again, and click to move it. And this way we completed the same exercise again. When I submit it, I still have 30 points. So in order to get more points to get closer to the bronze trophy, I actually need to take a new exercise to earn more points. So I don't get the bronze trophy by just repeating this uh, one exercise alone. Let's head back to the list by clicking the button on the left. And there's another example I want to show you. This time is the number four, listen, addition zero to 10. And this is a good example of exercise where students can actually differentiate themselves a little bit. They can, they are allowed to choose the difficulty level they want to go in. Uh, this is something we could do automatically based on the learning profile of the student uh, from previous answers. But this is actually more powerful when the students can make the decision on their own. It doesn't affect the scoring, but we will make this uh, choice visible in the learning analytics that you know which difficulty level the students have chosen. This is first grade math, so I think I can go with the hard one. In this exercise, we have 10 questions. You can see the numbers up here. And let's listen to the first calculation. Uh, I'm not sure if you're able to hear what I hear, so I'm going to repeat it. It says 3 plus 5, that's 8. Check answer. That's correct. We can see the calculation here. And next question. 4 plus 3, that's 7. And check answer. Great. Uh, the the on-screen numbers are really great on a tablet or a touchscreen device, but I'm working now on a laptop, so I just want to close it from the X, it goes here and right, and now I can use my computer's keyboard to give the answers. So I can press enter, and uh, enter to move on. Let's make a mistake. 3 plus 4, well that's 7, but let's say it's 5. Alright, uh, our Feedback is not that happy anymore, and it says a little more accuracy. 3 plus 4 is 5, no. Show the correct answer, oh, it's 7. And this allows the students to debug their thinking and find the correct solution. Uh, it's marked red. The student can, can't immediately go back and fix the uh, correct solution, but uh, this exercise is adaptive. So the same question will be asked in the remaining questions. So we will make sure the students have learned to solve that problem. But let me finish up this quickly and show you what happens after the last answer. Couple more to go. Five plus five, that's ten, on. And then the final question. 
5 plus 4, check answer. That was the last one. The next question is now submit answers or the submit button starts to blink up there. So we get the final assessment by submitting the answers. And this time we got 27 out of 30. We had a small mistake there, but it's still okay. Nothing to worry about. Let's move back to the list. And there's one more exercise I, I really want to show you. Uh, it's favorite of most of the students, a razor. Uh, this time in this exercise, we practice 10 pairs. So basically two numbers that when they're added up together, they form a 10. Let's close the instructions. Uh, I'm working on a laptop. So these symbols here try to describe that you need to use the arrow keys on your keyboard to drive the car. If you're using a touchscreen device, you will, you will have buttons on edges of the screen. No problem. The first number is in the middle, number four, and now we need to find the matching number to make a 10. So four plus six equals 10. So we need to pick up the lane with number six. And press forward to start the car. The streaming is uh, tolling on my uh, computer's performance, but let's hope I can solve the problems. If you want to go faster, you can press forward again, the car will accelerate. Or if you want more time to think, you can press backwards, it will slow down the car, it will give you more time to think. Again, some kind of differentiation matter for the students so they can actually adapt the exercise a little bit to their skills. Uh, if you give a wrong answer, the car will stop. And now you need to find out the correct answer from the remaining options here. Uh, you have all the time in the world, but you just lost one life, so you can't make infinite mistakes. On top of the screen, we have the green progress bar. It's showing us how far we are in the, in the track, so how much more we need to solve. It's hard to solve the problems and talk at the same time. <laughs> uh, let me show you what happens when I finish this uh, race. Probably we'll run out of lives before that. Let's make one more mistake. So. When you reach the last question or when you lose all your lives, you will get the final assessment automatically. Uh, 21 out of 30, not bad, could be improved, but nothing to worry about. Let's get back to the list here. So as you can see, I can see my progress all the time. I can see which exercises I have finished uh, with full points, with uh, some points missing or even some more points missing so this is the progress is continuously visible for the students and they know what they've been doing even if i head back to the dashboard by clicking the Edutain logo i can see my progress here in the lesson name and the label here is still yellow but once i reach any of the trophies i will get the trophy here also in front of the lesson name so there's a lot of ways for the students to know what they are doing, uh, how far they are from the goals, and so on. Well, let's jump into the teacher side, and I will teach you how you can get started uh, with Edutain Playground, and how you can set up everything, and maybe use it with your students. So I will switch to teacher view. Most of you are probably uh, logging in the first time ever. So instead of going straight to teacher dashboard, you actually get the list of ex uh, sorry courses available in Edutain Playground. So uh, I'll also go there by clicking the drop down on top and clicking the new course button on on the drop down. So basically, you have the list of uh, math grade levels, uh, also in in Spanish, if you prefer that. Uh, now, basically, what you do here is you pick the grade level you're teaching. If you are a fifth grade teacher, pick the fifth grade. Just click it. And then I strongly recommend that you rename the course to distinguish them 
from each other. Uh, I usually do something like the class name, math, and if you like, you can have the current year so you know uh, which school year it is. And this enables you to distinguish different uh, grade levels from each other. You don't need to do anything else, just press the green OK. It will copy the course. Ableton logo will start to spin on the top right. Uh, I don't want to take the time of copying it now. I already have a course for that. Uh, but when the copying is completed, it will automatically take you back to teacher dashboard and we can get start fresh like this. Uh, by default, all the lessons are closed. So there's nothing visible for the students. The idea here is that now you choose one uh, lesson topic that you want to start with the students. I started with the number 10 and 10 pairs, so I clicked the I icon. Now it shows me that I have one lesson open and there's no warning anymore. It's really important that you start with one lesson. Again, setting clear goals. Uh, there are a lot of great exercises, a lot of great things for students to practice and rehearse and so on. But if we open up too many lessons at once, it will be overwhelming uh, experience for the students. They don't know where to start from. and It might really affect their motivation. So start with one lesson. Of course, after this week lesson, you can open up another one, but there's two lessons visible and so on. Just remember to communicate to students which lesson we are working on today. If you want to move the lessons to different order, you can use the arrows on the uh, right side. So you can move it, for example, the first. So you find it easily. We have implemented the search function here because there are a lot of lessons. Uh, it might be easier to just uh, search for certain topic let's say we want to practice addition i can write it here first it will filter uh, all the lessons with the name addition in the uh, lesson name and it will list them here but after those we actually get a list of all the lessons in edelton playground that also contains the keyword addition so even though this is first grade math I can pick, for example, ninth grade polynomials addition and subtraction to my course if I like. If it's something that I need to practice with my students, I can just copy it here. Copy. Let's scroll up, remove the search. And now the ninth grade lesson is here at the bottom of my lesson list. So we can even practice something from completely different grade level if necessary. So this adapts really well to different curriculums, to different needs. If you want to know what's included in the lesson, it's really easy. Just click the lesson name and it will open up the lesson view from the teacher's side. Now, it lists all the exercises included in this lesson. You can even see the explanation of the symbols here on the right side. And as you notice here, we also have eyes in front of each exercise. So you are in total control with what kind of exercises there are for your students. There's no need to change these, but if you feel that there are some exercises you don't like, just click the eyes to hide them. And these are then not visible for your students. The trophies will adjust automatically, no problem. If you want to know what's, uh, what kind of exercise it is, you can just click the exercise name and you get the preview. You can actually play the game here. And when you feel that you have seen enough, you can just click the stop testing button on top and it will take you back to the lesson view from the student, uh, from the teacher. Like this. And when you have seen enough, just click the Edutin logo on top left to get back to the dashboard. And we are in the uh, beginning again, the main view. So at this point, we have a course. 
we have a lesson open the only thing we are missing so far is the student accounts and that's something i will show you next so on top menu we have users let's click that this will add students to my current course let's click the green add students button to add our students and basically the only thing you need to do is write your students name here names here and let me add me and my co-host Erke here if you have this list already somewhere uh, you can copy and paste it here you can use first names only or full names however you like just add one name per uh, line and then click next the usernames are generated automatically as you can see so there's no need to change this just click next the easy password setting is recommended for most students so we can actually go with that you can see the preview behind the pop-up and we click create accounts for me as an admin user it will give me an error for you it will just give you all the accounts already so you don't get the following warning here that's something that happens only for me but let's select editing school and click create this gives me the list of student credentials i can download the list and now you are ready to get these uh, accounts for each student uh, maybe through whatsapp or whatever tool you are using to communicate with students uh, it's important that you download the list even though we have emailed the pdf file to your email address it's still a good idea to download the list as well after closing this window we can't uh, get the passwords we can't see the passwords again so uh, if someone forgets their password the only way to get them back in every playground is to change it which can be do here again in the users menu by clicking the pencil icon in the table and change password generate scroll it and scroll down and click save and here we have new account for this student close so basically that's all you need to do you have a course you have a lesson and now you have even your students one thing is still missing and that's a really vital part and that's analytics we have to go with this now so when you get uh, submissions from students you actually start to see a lot of numbers and graphs in this teacher dashboard uh, one thing I already uh, follow up myself is the colors in the lessons uh, box so you can see how much points students have gathered all along uh, when they have completed the exercises so you know how much more they worked on multiplication table 3 compared to multiplication table uh, 10. Another thing I keep looking at is the trophies. I can see the total count here and also how many trophies were achieved this week and if i click the bronze trophy i can actually see the list of students who have achieved it and how long ago i actually spent some time in this morning uh, with the student 2 account and i completed the bronze trophy to show you this here below the trophies we have my favorite graph I love the student diligence. It gives me a really quick look over all my students in my classroom. Each dot represents one student. It shows me how many points they have gathered all together. Uh, every time they give a correct answer, they will get points. And this allows me to see like who has the most and who has none. Uh, there's also the time on vertical axis, so it allows me to see how much time it took them to work that number of scores. And I can see the difference that some students are able to get uh, 5,700 points uh, in 10 hours and three minutes, whereas some students have to use 27 hours and 27 minutes to get the same number of points. And this is now really important when we consider the workload of the students. 
Uh, we can also see the accuracy, so how many mistakes the students make uh, and, and, and how many correct answers they give. And also we have different colors here, but all these students are really good. So they are in green, excellent performance, except the teacher who is here as an example. And teacher's accuracy is quite low. So it actually states that the teacher might need some guidance, some help. So the colors are already telling you uh, who are doing well, who might need your help. And we also have a color red for the inactive students. So you know the students who need uh, help with their motivation. When we scroll down, we get a lot of uh, more uh, statistics already. We can see uh, how long ago students have been active. As you can see, uh, the student do, stu, uh, was active two hours ago, teacher one week ago, and the rest of the students uh, haven't been active for over a year. So this is already an old data set. But this helps you to monitor who's working on now, who has been working this week or today or yesterday and so on. Uh, then we have the latest achievements chart. Uh, this is also really great. You can see the students' progress either on daily basis, weekly basis, or bi-weekly basis. And here we can see that today, student two has uh, scored uh, 312 points, used 10 minutes time, completed 12 out of uh, 53 exercises and made in total 16 submissions and of course achieved the first trophy great job however the lesson is a basic unit of editing playground it contains kind of one topic so it's important to know how to monitor lesson progress for that we click the analytics button on top of the screen and we get a different perspective. Uh, this will load up the lesson analytics for us. And by default, it will load us the latest lesson that we have submissions in. So it will automatically know which was the uh, latest lesson that most of the students was working with. And for this time, it's of course the multiplication that I was uh, working on early this morning. Now we can see that there's been two active users in here. One of them was the student and one of them was the example teacher. We can see the uh, trophy, we can see the accuracy, we can see which difficulty level was chosen. I was lazy, I took the easy one. Yes, I'm guilty. <laughs> but we can also see that the good indication for you that you need to pay attention to the student. Uh, the colors in dark green. The number is not that important, but the color is. So if it's green, it's good. They're good to go. If it's orange, it might still be okay to go through the traffic lights. So it's a pass. But if it's red, uh, there is clearly some difficulties and the student probably needs your help to overcome those issues. Uh, there is a lot more analytics in here. Uh, I won't go into too much detail in here. Uh, these are the key things, the ones you can see on dashboard. And by clicking the analytics, you will get the latest lesson the students have been working with. If this is not the lesson you're interested in, you can click the drop down and then you can switch to any other lesson you like. We can, for example, see one of the lessons with more uh, submissions than just me and the student. Or if you want to take a look at the progress of individual students, the drop down on right side allows you to choose individual students. But for example, here we can see overall accuracy 90% really high. Probably exercises might be even too easy. But the key thing is that we can see the trophies in the table and we can see who haven't completed their exercises. So it's really easy to see that the last two students in my list have not completed this lesson. They haven't completed uh, about the principles of Finland math. And on the right side, we have guides concerning Edition Playground. So there's a general user guide, there's a guide how to have an online exam, we can ask questions. Uh, you can have the instruction videos here so you can watch them. I really recommend the third one, getting started, quick tutorial. If you walk through the steps I just took with you, 
but only in three minutes. Let me switch back to my slides. And here we go. So a couple of quick tips uh, getting started with students. Again, these principles here are not strictly only Edutron Playground. You can apply these principles with uh, other platforms as well, but they are built together with Edutron Playground. So they work really well hand in hand. Like we mentioned, keeping up the routines is really important. And this applies also to Edutron Playground. Uh, it's really easy to set up these certain routines. So basically set up a certain day and certain time when you open up new lessons or when you open up one new lesson and then the students will know that okay every let's say tuesday at 12 the teacher opens up me a new lesson and i can start work on, working on my math problems and then my teacher will check my uh, performance by the next tuesday and i need to be finished up with my exercises like that or it can be tuesday and friday or however you want to put it. The important thing is that you have a system for that. Another really important key thing here is that to make sure that the students understand that you are expecting them to finish up the lesson with a trophy. So this is super important to communicate. And once you have more than one lesson open, uh, I suggest that you communicate really clearly that this week's goal is to finish up lesson number, let's say three, or finish up lesson number five. And another thing that considers the tro trophies is give positive feedback. When the students get a trophy, don't be afraid of to give them some positive feedback on that, give some praises. Even better if you can do it in an online conference so the other kids can hear it too. That creates a really uh, positive environment. Uh, it's important to figure out what happens when the students get the trophies or if they don't get them. And uh, one of the most powerful ways of uh, motivating students is to have impact on their assessment. So if the trophies can somehow impact the assessment, that's the secret how you get a lot of students to work hard. And one example is uh, that you have exams uh, basically all the time. And in math, some exams, uh, some lessons in Editor Playground, they consider the topics in the exam. So you can actually take a look at those lessons. And if a student has completed all those lessons with a bronze trophy, they might get one additional point to the exam. So even before they start, they already have one point. Uh, if they have all silver, it might be two points, all gold, three points, all diamond, four points. Uh, this is something you can scale up with the assessment. So you can figure out what the proper scaling is. But this is a really, really powerful uh, motivator. And a lot of teachers do this already. And of course, one way to affect the student's motivation is also to communicate the successes and, and uh, well, lacking of trophies to parents as well, because parents are also usually hopefully interested in how their students are doing, how they are learning. So that's also a really good channel to uh, increase. Start with a familiar topic so they can rehearse, they can practice, the, they can learn how to use the platform. It doesn't take long. Oh and explain students when you start that, okay, this this time we have only one lesson. The next time you log in, uh, let's say on Thursday, I have opened up a new lesson for you. And then we move on to that. But today we concentrate on today's lesson. And before the next time, you will need to get a trophy from that lesson. And it's a really good idea to use screen sharing on any of the video conferencing tools to show this to the students. A weekly checklist for you guys, it's quite similar to the previous one, but uh, it, it's, it's uh, formulated a bit differently. So again, setting up the goals. So 
just open up one new lesson uh, or one to three new lessons each week, but one at a time. Don't open up all of them at once. Make sure the students understand what they are expected to do. And log in to Edit and Playground, uh, if not daily, at least every second day. Rather, maybe, probably better to do daily, at least in the beginning, to see how the students are doing. So you're able to help them, you're able to answer the questions and so on. Uh, check the previous homework before you open up a new lesson or homework. Check the previous uh, learning progress. And before you start, think what happens if the students don't get the trophies. Uh, what are the possibilities? What can you do? Uh, one valid option is just to inform maybe the parents that, okay, your, your child has not completed the tasks I asked him or her to do. Another thing, what to do if the students get something better than just the bronze? Uh, it's a good idea to have something, some positive impact for them. All right, it's begun to almost conclude to this <coughs> session. I think we are really well in time. Uh, this webinar was provided to you by Edigen, and we are a spin-off company from Uni University of Turku, which is the second largest university, university in Finland, and it's globally ranked in the top 1%. And what Edigen does is we provide the digital learning and teaching innovation in Finland math to students and teachers all over the world. And in core of this is Edelton Playground, the platform I just presented to you. And it's all based on a lot of research, hence our research background from the university. And like I already told you, it's it's been uh, chosen by a lot of Finnish teachers. And it's I would say it's the most popular digital math tool among Finnish, Finnish teachers. So they are really enjoying it. And I'm, I'm really happy we are able to help teachers during the school closure and remote teaching challenges with the tools like this. I hope we can help a lot of you guys as well. Uh, we will be sending you these slides and, and all the material uh, after the webinar. Also, this will be linked in the uh, WhatsApp group for the support. So we have gathered some further reading for you guys if you are interested to hearing about the teacher's perspective or, or more about Finland math or Edison Playground. We have collected some important links here as well. But before I quit, uh, Erki, maybe you are also willing to say some uh, yeah. final words? Yeah, definitely. And, and thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation of the of the Edison Playground. Uh, I think something we wanted to do here was first, as the name of the seminar applied, to talk about our experiences and uh, about good practices in remote learning. And we also wanted to give you something concrete to work on. So as we mentioned, if you have any tools you've been using, for example, for online learning, it's a good idea to keep on using those tools, but also you're free, free to try out Edison Playground, which is based on those pedagogic principles we talked about during this whole seminar. And uh, we hope you really got something out of this, whatever system you're using, and uh, we hopefully can make your remote learning a bit more effective and a bit easier. And I think it's important to realize that there are difficulties and you just need to be brave enough to try out new things and to accustom to a whole new situation and to sort of so leadership to your students as well and it's because a lot of students are also see you know in a whole new situation and finding it, it a bit difficult to accustom to so it's important that you bring your students along to new experience and, and try to come up with positive things about the whole situation yeah don't be afraid of making mistakes if those happens to everybody a week alert for them so that's it. i think that's a really good um, mindset Definitely. That's all about the growth mindset, which we try to emphasize in this situation as well. Yeah. Uh, those of you who are in the WhatsApp group uh, linked in the beginning of this live stream, if you have questions, concerns, anything like that after the webinar, please feel free to use that as a support channel as well. 
Uh, you can ask questions from us. We try to help you the best we can. And uh, thank you for participating. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. Definitely. Thank you very much. All right. See you guys. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.